This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we take a closer look and dig a little deeper into this week's sermon. What's going on, Bible nerds? We are looking at the rest of Acts 23 today. So let's take a closer look. This is a cool story. Um, I didn't really have time to do the story justice, I don't think, in my story of it on Sunday. But it's this really interesting story where Paul is caught in this spot where he's being held by the Roman government until he can figure until they can figure out what they want to do, what the Jews want to do with him. What is he accused of? Is anything wrong? So he's being held in capt he's being jailed. Um and he's in holding, waiting on all this to happen. And there comes out that there is a plot to kill him. Okay, this is what verse 12 says. In the morning, the Jews joined in a conspiracy and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who joined in this conspiracy. They got 40 Jews. Mm-hmm. that said, you know what? It is the most important thing that we're going to take an oath. We're going to do a religious ceremony where we vow not to eat or drink anything until we kill Paul. Mm-hmm. There is nothing more important, not even eating or drinking, mm-hmm. than killing Paul for 40 religious leaders yep. that Paul thinks are his people. Mm-hmm. Right. He said that he was on trial for resurrection of the dead. Pharisees and Sadducees both believe differently about that and coexist. Paul was trying to live in their world. And they are trying to kill him. And in order to pursue safety, Paul has had to pull his Roman citizenship card. Paul is playing a this strange religious political power movement. Um, Paul is existing in a world right now where he was trying to exist with his faith and his faith community has sought to murder him. And he had to go to his political government for safety. I want you to think about that. The institution that's supposed to be providing him life is threatening that life. They want to take that life. And he's having to get protection of life from his government yeah. against his religious connections and community. Yeah. I want to read you a couple of things that uh, Willie James Jennings says on this text. Paul, the disciple citizen, will face the purest form of violence at the hands of some of his own people. Assassination. There have been plots against Paul before this, in Acts 9 and 20, but this strikes at the heart of life because those who would kill Paul make make death their intimate partner, offering their own bodies to if they fail to unleash its power on the body of Paul. Assassins marry death and thereby become its agent. Mm. Um, I want you to understand that. That these people have chosen to make the thing we are fighting against the agent of their problems. Yeah. This is a major issue in how religious institutions run. This is about power and corruption in the religious institution. Now, Paul's navigating this and 
navigating it well. But it goes on to say um, in verse 14. Well, here, we'll read it. Picking up in verse 14. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the council must notify the tribune to bring him down to you on the pretext that you want to make a more thorough examination of his case, and we are ready to do away with him before he arrives. So now they got a plan, and they go to the council of elders, and they go, hey, this is what we want to do. We've taken this vow. We need you to call for him. We're going to lie and wait. He won't even make it here. We're going to kill him on the way in. This is premeditated. They now have a plan of how they are going to act out the murder of Paul. Yeah. This is what Willie James Jennings says. They promised themselves slow and painful death to the extent they failed to bring the quick death of Paul. Indeed, to engage in any planning to kill for nationalist, military, political, or economic reasons is to enter the slow and painful death of the killers. There is no nobility in planning the death of another, nor may we justify it for the expediency of saving a life or a way of life. Such planning is already death, already a gesture of obedience to death, Announcing it, our Lord and Master. Dang. This is what I think Jesus is getting at. When he's asked the question, right, about any answers with lust, right? He's like, I tell you that even if you look at a woman with lust, You've committed adultery with her in your heart already. Yeah. This is what Willie James Jennings is saying. Is that like it's the heart, the disposition towards the world um, that we should be in pursuit of. And, and so even to plan someone's death is to bring about experiences of death. And sure. then to go on and commit the most act of violence, death, taking someone's life and vowing yourself to death if you do not pull it off. Do you see how death has encompassed the entire existence of these people? Yeah. These are a very unhealthy religious group. And these are religious leaders. Yeah. Um. They want to kill Paul, and Paul has Paul is trying to navigate these waters in any which way he can. And the text says Paul's nephew, verse 16, the son of Paul's sister heard about the ambush. And so he goes and tells Paul. He goes and tells Paul, what's up? He goes and he gets into the barracks and he tells Paul. And Paul says... Um, verse 17 Paul called one of the centurions and said take this young man to the tribune for he has something to report to him and so he goes and he takes him to the tribune remember the tribune is the government official that steps in and starts this whole thing when they're trying to arrest him in the temple and they're beating him yeah right you remember this Mm -hmm. they are so violent they are fully encompassed by death the thing opposite of the message of torah the message of the old testament and certainly the message of jesus they are fully encompassed by death and so the tribune uh steps in and at this point says hey this is insane we got to send paul to the governor we got to send Paul out of here. And so um, 
Paul heads to go before the governor. That's that's the that transition happens between 16 and 22. And I'm fixing to read in 23 and we're going to pick up and see what this is like for Paul. Then he summoned two this is picking up in verse 23. Then he summoned two of the centurions and said, "Get ready to leave by 9 o'clock tonight." For Caesarea with 200 soldiers. Jeez. 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and take him safely to Felix the governor. Okay. What should this tell you? Uh, They really want Paul dead. And... They are doing everything they can to protect him. They got a group of 40 men that have taken a vow to kill Paul. Mm. Religious zealots. Terrorists. Mm-hmm. That's what we, that's, that, let's call it what it is. That is what we called 9-11. That is what we called Muslim extremism. Mm. Religious zealots. These are the same things. And this is how the governor, or this is how the tribune chose to respond. We got to get Paul the heck up out of here. So, Paul, you got to go to where the governor is. And we're also going to, for 40 religious zealots, we're going to transport you at 9 o'clock, three hours after sundown, We're going to start this journey and we're going to do it quick and swift because they're going to come tomorrow morning to ask us to release him there. Yeah. They feel that they need to respond with 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. Yeah. They want more than tw- almost 12 times the men with significant advancements in weapons yeah. and equipment with the horsemen and everything. That looks like a very safe place for Paul. For sure. Paul, these Jews are not getting to Paul. Yeah. But here's what you can't remember or here's what you can't forget. These people are holding Paul because they have no problem killing him. Mm -hmm. He just played his Roman citizen card, and so they have to play out very carefully if they kill him. Yeah. This is not safety for Paul. Paul is still in captivity. Sure. Paul is living in a world where the two worlds he knows are crumbling beneath him. His life exists in the balance of his faith community and his Roman citizenship. And his citizenship is not safety. It is currently providing him protection of life, but it does not provide him life because in the balance, it holds the power to end his life. Sure. And yet the church is the one the institution, the religious folk are the ones creating this problem for him. Yeah. They are the ones out to kill him. And I think Luke is crafting this narrative for a very specific purpose. These are, this is what Willie James Jennings says. Oh, uh, side note. This is for free uh, before we move on. Um, This note here about the thought of killing someone, Mm -hmm. the planning of it, and that being sin with Jesus' connection to lust and adultery um, or sexual immorality. That um, idea of thinking about sin is a great definition of 
sin for the conversation that's going to come out this week on Pints and Perspectives. Mm. I've already filmed it. And in there, we like Adam asks me for a definition of sin. Mm. I cannot come up with it yeah. on the spot. I do answer the question appropriately, but this this is how I want you thinking about sin. That things, even the thought of death is sinful acts. Like the experience and pursuit of death and things that bring about death are sin. Mm. That is what sin is. So this is what Willie James Jennings says about this existence in this world between these two powers that are currently not providing life. Yeah. Luke has set this up masterfully, I think. This is where he's talking about the uh, nephew coming. This is a story of the future saving the future. This young man will act for the sake of Paul and the gospel to thwart the agents of death. These are strange times, and Paul is in a strange place. At this moment, the state will do for Paul what it would not do for Jesus, deliver him from the hands of death. But make no mistake, the state is no friend of Paul or the gospel. It holds no warmth for, the, for this disciple of Jesus, but at this moment, it is needed for Paul's survival against the people of God. This is the sheer horror of this portion of Luke's narrative. And then he goes on to say that you can read this two different ways. And the first way to read it is that there's the necessity of the state as protector. But if you do that, you have to overlook the fact that the state is holding him with every intention of killing him mm. if they think it needs to happen. Yeah. So it is not a safe place. And this is what he says. The state in final analysis does not have the power to resist the seductive power of death because it will kill again and again. But you can go on and think about it this way, that Paul, uh, well, this is what he says. Another interpretive trajectory presents itself precisely in the space of Paul, surrounded by soldiers on horseback and on foot. He travels with them away from danger to danger, being led by the Spirit of God. Because the work of the witness must go towards the state and towards Israel, towards Gentile and Jew. Caught between Israel and Rome, Paul is not being delivered from the former to the latter. He is drawing both to a destiny in God and a decision for or against the resurrected Lord in a space and time from which there will be no escape. On Sunday, I asked, what does it mean to be a person of faith? What does it mean to exist in this world of uncertainty and not necessarily have this big miraculous moment? No. Not really have this road to Damascus moment, but having these places where we have done the work and we are positioned in our lives that when these opportunities are presented to us, we know how to navigate them. Sure. Prayerfully, we know how to navigate them with the ethic of Jesus, with the consideration of a Christian worldview. Um, I think Willie James Jennings' final thoughts on this on this text are, are so good. I'm going to read them. Even if we wish to imagine that the state can protect what it does not understand, that is, the religious against the religious, it cannot even protect itself from that which it imagines it understands so well the seduction of violence and the power of death. This is precisely the deliverance that the resurrected Jesus brings. Mm. I think what it means to be a person of faith is it means to be a person that doesn't pursue death. Sure. Never pursue death. That is the problem here. That is what we see, is that the message of Jesus is one of resurrection conquering and victory over death death yeah. cannot be the answer to our problems jesus has shown us that that is a progressive way um, and paul exists in this world of uncertainty and we know what paul's prison experience was like 
Now, I don't think this is necessarily the worst of it because technically Paul's a Roman citizen. He's in Roman custody because he's protect Rome is protecting him. And so these are not just heinous prison conditions. Um, these are what you might think in a cave somewhere in the city. You know, sure. Jail bars. Like, this is a normal jail. Um, but there are a lot of really bad prisons. But Paul wrote several letters while he was in prison. Um or in captivity, probably something very similar to what he's in now with these Romans. Mm -hmm. um, Paul was a very prayerful person. Paul was a very considerate person. Paul thought about the things of God. Paul had a worldview that he was trying to live within. Paul was on a mission, yeah. a mission to bring about experiences of life and liberation in the name of Jesus. Um, Paul being that person in pursuit of life and liberation and being prayerful makes him ready. Being a person of faith is not having faith in moments of uncertainty because you now need to pull your faith, your genie out of a bottle yeah. off the top shelf. Being a person of faith is being a person who lives a life of faith. So when you get to roads of uncertainty, you go, hey, I got this. Yeah. I'm ready to navigate this and yeah. trusting that God has the best intentions for you, that God is going to provide things for you, paths, way out, yeah. ways out. Um, being a person of faith in moments of uncertainty is being a person of faith in moments of certainty. Sure. Being a person of faith and navigating moments of certainty is what you do because you've done the hard work of being a person of faith in moments of certainty. Yeah. Mm. That is how you navigate these unknown waters.